we are in an especially fitting place for this evening's event. For while a student at the University of Michigan, Raoul Wallenberg wrote to his family in Sweden about how he loved attending performances presented by the University Musical Society right here in Hill Auditorium. He was an architecture student and no doubt closely observed the lines and details of this magnificent building. Almost exactly 75 years ago, on October 24th, 1933, students, faculty, and citizens of Ann Arbor crowded here into Hill Auditorium to hear Serge Kusevitsky and the Boston Symphony perform a program of Mozart, Stravinsky, and Brahms. It is not hard to imagine that Raoul Wallenberg, then in his junior year, was perched in one of your seats. Raoul Wallenberg had a reputation as an excellent student, warm, easygoing, good-humored, and relentlessly inquisitive. The scion of one of Sweden's great families, he was restless and always eager for the territory ahead. He was a venturesome traveler who, during turbulent and uncertain times, spent his summers hitchhiking through much of North America. Graduating in the depths of a great global depression, and appropriately for this evening's event, <laughs> he chose to strike out for South Africa, to learn more of the world, and to seek some opportunity. Our guest tonight might find some amusing irony in knowing that Wallenberg wrote his grandfather who was then Sweden's ambassador in Turkey, that he had never in his life been so cold as when he arrived in Cape Town in July. <laughs> After several months in South Africa, Wallenberg returned northward, where he became a witness to Europe's unmeasured unraveling and the descent into World War II and the Holocaust. Raoul Wallenberg's short path ended 10 years later where, for six months in 1944 and 1945, along the banks of the Danube in the city of Budapest, he fought to save one of the last surviving communities of Jews in Europe. In the final months of the war, neutral Sweden had deputized Wallenberg, who spoke both German and Hungarian, to rescue as many people as he could. He contested with Adolf Eichmann, who Hitler had deputized on a parallel mission to complete the final solution. Wallenberg found Budapest a discordant city of chaos, brutality, desperation, and murder. He mobilized hope and willed the possible in the face of very long odds. Modesty, charm, courage, bluster, cunning, and steely conviction worked in him in equal parts. He organized a network of courageous companions to pull thousands to safety under the thin shield of Swedish neutrality, holding on to lives while he played for time and the end of the war. Declaring buildings to be under the diplomatic protection of Sweden, Wallenberg fabricated his own version of a special Swedish passport which indeed looked very authoritative and not to be discounted. He distributed these lifelines widely. Where a plea to Nazi soldiers and Hungarian fascists did not work, bribery, blackmail, and threats might. He was not afraid to warn the Nazi commander of Budapest that he would hang as a war criminal. Through artful and desperate improvisation, he managed to save nearly 100,000 persons from the death camps. Raoul Wallenberg's last notes faded quickly. Arrested within days of stop by Stalin's agents who entered Budapest with the besieging Soviet army, he disappeared into a darkness from which he had saved so many. His final fate remains unknown. But his courageous insistence endures that one person can make a difference. And tonight, we honor another remarkable person who, like Wallenberg, has shown how the human spirit can triumph when justice and human dignity seem but faint echoes. 
To introduce Archbishop Desmond Tutu and to present the University of Michigan's Wallenberg Medal, I am pleased to present to you the President of the University of Michigan, Mary Sue Coleman. The awarding of the Wallenberg Medal is a celebrated moment in the life of the University of Michigan. It is a modest gesture by the university in contrast to the profound courage and strength of those we honor, individuals who have made great personal sacrifices to secure the dignity and well-being of their fellow citizens. The full spirit of such humanitarianism is difficult to capture in one evening. And tonight is no exception with our honoring of Nobel Peace Prize winner, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Just as Raoul Wallenberg recognized the devastation and inhumanity of Hitler's madness, Archbishop Desmond Tutu was an eyewitness to the brutality and folly of South of Africa's apartheid. Raoul Wallenberg toiled underground to save countless Jewish lives Archbishop Tutu raised his voice to tell the world of black lives being lost to racism, poverty, and sheer brutality. He rightly called apartheid evil and unchristian. Both men placed themselves at great personal risk to help others. In doing so, they not only rescued individuals from violence and death, they showed society the futility of intolerance and the timber of courage and decency. Archbishop Tutu's powerful voice continues to resonate throughout the world, a fragmented world, fragmented by race, by politics, by income, and by religion. His passionate messages of equality and peace cause people to think, and more importantly, his words inspire people to act. Archbishop Tutu, you are ceaseless in using the bully pulpit to advance justice and democracy. Your leadership on the world stage has helped transform the future of South Africa and her children. But you have not limited yourself to geographic boundaries. Rather, you are a model citizen of the world, and it is our privilege to award you the University of Michigan's Wallenberg Medal. Please. Madam President, Chair of the Wallenberg Committee, distinguished members of the university community, all of you very dear friends, good evening. Oh. What? <laughs> Good evening. Mm, that's possible. But thank you so very, very much, Madam President, for your very kind introduction. You know that the sometimes say about certain people, oh, well, he's or she's 
very well known and uh, really doesn't need any introduction. Um, I've told this story before. I'm, I'm not uh, particularly original. I'm very repetitive. Um, <laughs> but one day I was in San Francisco and uh, uh, minding my own business as I always do. Uh, <laughs> when uh, a lady came up gushing, uh, oh, she was so warm, and, and she was greeting me, and she said, hello, Archbishop Mandela. Uh, <laughs> sort of getting two for the price of one. You know. <laughs> but thank you so very much for this extraordinary award, this prestigious award of this wonderful institution. Thank you, Wallenberg Committee, for choosing me and seeking to let me join a remarkable group of human beings, numbering amongst them such extraordinary persons as Elie Wiesel and the Dalai Lama and so on. I have usually said that when I am given such awards, I can really accept them only in a representative capacity. Because the people you want to honor are the many, many millions who for a very long time were anonymous, extraordinary human beings in their courage. And I had the privilege of being, of being their leader. And what is a leader without followers? And so when you stand out in a group, it is only because you are being carried on the shoulders of others. And so on behalf of all of those remarkable human beings who are often described in a misnomer as ordinary, there are no ordinary human beings. Every single person is extraordinary. For each, each one of us is a God carrier. But yes, for those we often refer to as the ordinary, I accept this prestigious award. And now don't go away with the notion that, oh, isn't he, oh, he he's, so, he's so modest. <laughs> I'm nothing of the sort. <clears throat> I, and I tell the story of how my wife and I went to uh, West Point Military Academy and at the end of the visit, the cadets, to commemorate that visit, gave me a cadet cap and um, uh, trying it on, it did not fit. Uh, a nice wife would have said, oh dear, uh, the, the cap is too small. My, my very dear wife said his head is too big. <laughs> so, thank you. 
thank you so, so very, very much. I have a book of cartoons. Some of you may have seen it. It's a, it's a collection of charming line drawings by the late Mel Kelman, who was a cartoonist for the British newspaper, The Observer. And the title of this anthology of cartoons is My God. One of them shows God uh, somewhat uh, disconsolate um, because God is getting all these different uh, uh, prayers. God, we are farmers, please send rain. Um, somebody else, oh God, please, we're going to a picnic, please give us sunshine. And, <laughs> and, and the, the, it's God then says, oh dear, sometimes I, I wish I could say, don't call me, I'll call you. Uh, <laughs> but the, the one that I wanted to refer to is, is one um, that shows God um, somewhat bemused and he's, he, or she, um, <laughs> And he's, he's sort of scratching his head. He said, oh dear, I think I've lost my copy of the divine plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you, when you look at the state of the world, you wonder whether God ever had a plan at all. <laughs> I mean, just think of it. You have a devastating drought in one place, and you have an equally devastating flood in another place. And you say, oh my God, do you really mean you couldn't arrange things in such a way that there was enough water everywhere rather than the, the mess? And it's almost as if God makes it incredibly difficult for those who would want to justify the ways of God, the thing that they call a theodicy, where you try to work, I mean, try to explain why it could be that in the universe of a good God, all of these awful things happen. You have a, a holocaust, you have a genocide, you go on and you have, you have this doleful catalog. Just look at what's happening now, therefore. Burma, Tibet, the Middle East, Somalia, and just now the awful, awful accounts that are coming out of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And of course, Zimbabwe. It is a real mess. And how could you ever hope to be credible when you say to people, as we did actually, when you say to people, you know, this is God's world. And God is in charge. Those many times at home in our struggle against the awfulness of apartheid, when the apartheid rulers were strutting arrogantly as if they were invincible cocks of the walk, 
and our people were being treated as if they were rubbish, their dignity trodden underfoot carelessly. How could you ever hope to be credible, believable? But that's exactly what we said. We said, hey, 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 this, this is God's world. God is in charge. Sometimes, of course, you, you wished you could whisper in God's ear, God, we know that you are in charge. Why don't you make it slightly more obvious? <laughs> yes, it is as if we were mocking those who suffer under the yoke of oppression, of injustice. I mean, you, you go to a, a Darfur and, you, and you, you look at the conditions under which those people live there. A situation where for a woman to dare go beyond the safety of the camp is the surest invitation for her to be, to be raped. To, to, to know that there are so many parts of our world where rape has become a weapon of war, where child soldiers are used You know all of those things. You know how they recruit young people to be, become child soldiers. They make them, they make them shoot members of their family and make certain that they will not be able to return home. And you see, what, 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 what kind of universe is this? And then, and then yes, you say no, no, no. Those of us who say that this is a moral universe don't in, inhabit some cuckoo land. It is for real, it is for real that Injustice and oppression will, will not have the last word. And when you look at the verdict of history, there was a time when Hitler looked like he was going to vanquish all of Europe. Where is he now? when Stalin had his gulags and killed at his whim Mussolini, Franco. I mean, I mean, I mean fed, fed his crocodiles, fed, fed him with, fed them with those he, who fell out with him. Where is he now? History, history seems to give the evidence, yeah, yeah. This is, this is a moral universe. This is a, un I mean, we used, to, we used to say to the South African government, apartheid government, hey, <laughs> you have lost, you have already lost. And we're being nice to you. We're being nice to you white people in South Africa, I mean. <clears throat> we're being nice to you. We're saying, come, 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 join the winning side. Join the winning side. Eh? 
And, and you look and you say, yes. All of those who strutted around, who looked like they would never, never be defeated. Without exception, have beaten the dust and done so ignominiously. And so, and so, and so, in 1990, the prison, the prison doors opened and Nelson Mandela walked out. And so, and so in 1994, the world looked on in amazement as it saw those long, 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 long lines of South Africans of all races, those long lines snaking their way slowly to the polling booth on that magical day, a day like no other, the 27th of April. They asked us, how did you feel? I say, hey, man, how do you describe falling in love? <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you describe a beautiful rose to a blind person? How do you, how do you describe a glorious symphony to someone deaf? Well, when you vote for the first time, when you are 63 years of age, for the first time in the land of your birth. Now you know something? Yes, we won a glorious victory over the awfulness of apartheid. But what is so marvelous is it was your victory too. We wouldn't, we really would not have made it on our own we had the support of some incredible human beings. You had a president at the time who had a policy called constructive engagement. I sat with him in the Oval Office and tried to persuade him to apply sanctions against the apartheid government, he would have none of it. And so, and so we appealed over his head to the American people. <laughs> we appeal, I will appeal to yourself. <laughs> and I want to tell you that it was fantastic. I, I used to come, and I would come about the time when students ought to have been concerned about degrees and, and their grades, April, May. It was incredible. I mean, I, I, I went, I didn't go to all of the <laughs> campuses, there are too many, uh, but to those that I went, it was just in fantastic. I don't know what cockles are, but it warmed the cockles of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> To see, to see students sitting out in the baking sunshine 
in order to pressure their institutions to divest. There were, I mean, the people were just fantastic. Those who were involved in the anti-apartheid movement and young people like most of you here, not exclusively, because the anti-apartheid movement had a whole range of people, people who were prepared to be arrested on our behalf, people who were prepared, well, they were prepared, they, pre they prayed for us, people who were prepared not to buy South African wine, and it's very lovely, it's, it's one of the best around. Uh, <laughs> and not so expensive, I mean you. <laughs> people did that for us. That was, that, was, that was extraordinary. And so, and so, the moral climate in this country changed. And where you had a very popular president standing up against the anti-apartheid legislation that would impose sanctions, you know, you changed, you changed the moral climate to such an extent that Congress, not only did it pass that legislation, but it mustered a presidential veto override. And so, and so we are free today. We are free today because of you and your, 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 well, I was going to say four pairs, but that doesn't seem quite right. Uh, those, who, those who went before you, uh, who are now probably sitting here and not there. <laughs> and you see, I've come, and although it's 14 years down the line, I come to say to you, thank you. Thank you. Is that how, is that how you, if, if somebody removed the shackles from your, from your, wrists and from your ankles. You think that is how you would slap them? Okay, I know that you are, you are shy. Uh, I discovered, in fact, that I had a magic wand. When I wave it over you, as I do now, it, it turns you into instant South Africans. And so I say, fellow South Africans, let's give these Americans a real humdinger. Come on now. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Uh, yes, well, I wave it over you, <laughs> and you revert to your normal shy self. <laughs> but that is actually for real, uh, because I, uh, yeah, unless you have been unfree, it's difficult to understand what it does mean to become free. And thank you, thank you.
Thank you. I, I have to be careful about this, uh, asking people to clap. I was, I was with a group of young people once in Australia, and I said, you know, the trouble with us is that we don't celebrate who we are. Let's give ourselves a warm hand. And they did a wonderful thing that nearly took the roof off. And then I said, well, let's give God a standing ovation. And they really went to town. <laughs> and when they finished without thinking, I said, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, Thank you. <laughs> you remember that there were those people who said, ah, yeah, they have made this transition from injustice to freedom relatively peacefully, but you wait. As soon as a black-led government is in power, we are going to see the most awful orgy of revenge and retribution. And then, and then, the world watched and saw the extraordinary spectacles unfolding before their very eyes of the process of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where given a wonderful lead by Nelson Mandela of magnanimity, of generosity, of spirit, a president who said, let us walk the path of forgiveness and reconciliation rather than that of revenge and retribution, and people followed him. It was an extraordinary privilege to have been asked to preside over the process of healing of a traumatized people as a wounded healer. For none of us in the commission could claim to be morally superior to any of those who came before us. None of us could claim that we had not ourselves been deeply, deeply wounded by the ghastliness of apartheid. And it was, it was just an incredible experience sitting there and and listening to people give accounts of grievous, grievous suffering. People who by rights ought to have been consumed by bitterness and resentment and who had a lust for revenge. They were nothing of the sort. Amazing, 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 sitting there and listening to this white woman who had been at a Christmas dinner party when one of the liberation movements attacked the venue, a golf club, and they threw hand grenades, and several people were killed. And this woman says that she was so badly wounded that she was in ICU for, for weeks. And when she came out, her children had to bathe her, clothe her, feed her because she was so disabled and she still had shrapnel in her body. <laughs> I, 
And, and she was saying, you know, she couldn't go through a security checkpoint because <laughs> it would go berserk. Uh, uh, and, and, then, and then she says of the occasion that left her in this condition. She said, she said, <laughs> she said, it has enriched my life. Enriched my life. <laughs> and you, you sit there. And then, and then she goes on and she says, I, 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 I want to meet the perpetrator. I want to meet him in a spirit of forgiveness. I want, I want to forgive him, which is mind blowing in itself. And then, and then she goes on and says, and I hope she, he forgives me. And, and many times I would say, I would say, shh, let's be quiet, for we are in the presence of the holy. Let's be quiet. We ought really to take off our shoes, for we are standing on holy ground. It, it, it was fantastic. But of course, you had the other side as well. Those who came applying for, for amnesty, you could qualify for amnesty only if you accused yourself, you, you told of the things that you did. And you'd hear something like, we gave him, we gave him drugged coffee. We shot him in the head. We, we burned his body. And it takes eight, nine hours to burn a human body. And whilst the body was burning here, we were having a barbecue on the side. We were drinking beer. And you see, what could have happened to the humanity of people? What could have happened that people could sink so low? And then, and then you realized, hey, 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 hey. Yes, indeed, there, but for the grace of God, go I. That the perpetrators were not demons. They didn't have horns. They didn't have a tail. They were, they were ordinary human beings like you, like me. They went, they went to church. They were respectable members of their communities. In Germany, it was those who called German Christians who collaborated with Hitler. So, so, so what, what? All of this was telling us is, yeah, you and I have an extraordinary capacity for evil. Yeah, you and I. For you see, none of us could say that had we been subjected to the same conditions and upbringing, these had undergone, we could not predict that we wouldn't have turned out like them. But yes, 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 we have that capacity for evil. But more gloriously, more exhilaratingly, you and I have this incredible capacity for good. Eh? You. You and I, 
unbelievable. But you and I are made for goodness. That is what we have been created for. You and I are created for transcendence, for laughter, for gentleness, for caring. You and I. And so you, you understood a little bit why, why God might have lost God's copy of the divine plan. Because God deliberately did not create the world perfect. That is something that is said in so many religious traditions. Because God is looking to you and to me to be, to be fellow workers with God. To turn, to help God turn this world into the kind of, of home that God wants it to be. A more gentle, a more caring, a more compassionate, a more, a more sharing, a more sharing world. I finish, I finish, but I must tell you the story. Uh, some of you will have heard it, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> you were all searched when you came in to make sure that you didn't have tomatoes and um, eggs to throw at the speaker. Uh, there was a farmer. Farmer had chickens in his backyard. But he had a strange looking chicken. And the farmer wondered, I mean, the strange looking chicken, it does behave like the other chickens, it pecks away, but it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't look quite like the others. And then a traveler comes along who knows about these things and says to the farmer, no, 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 man, there's no chicken there. That's an eagle. And the farmer said, so? He said, well, so the, the, the traveler says, please give it to me. And the farmer gives him this strange looking chicken. And he takes this chicken and he goes up, up, up to the top of the mountain, and he waits for the sun to rise. And as the sun glides through, this man says, fly, eagle, fly. And the strange looking chicken spreads out its pinions, shakes itself, <laughs> and lifts off. And it soars and disappears way, way into the rising sun. And God says to us, hey, you are no chicken. You are an eagle. Fly, eagle, fly. And God expects you, us, to spread out our opinions, shake ourselves, <laughs> lift off, and soar, and soar towards goodness, soar towards transcendence, towards beauty, towards laughter, towards caring, towards sharing. Fly, eagle, fly.
We've asked three students from the University of Michigan's Honors Program, Emily Foley, Joel Berger, and Maya Diedrich, to prepare some questions for you. They've just been handed to me. I haven't read them. So would you mind handling a few? One. <laughs> Has the, how, how has the role of youth in the pursuit of justice changed since the anti-apartheid movement? And how do you see the role of youth today in our, in our own countries and abroad? I have to say that I have a lot of time for young people. How has it changed? They use the internet a lot more. Actually, but that's, that's been a fantastic plus. You know, uh, people, people like making generalizations about young people that frankly upset me. If young people become disillusioned, who is to blame? If it is not those who are supposed to be role models and all of that kind of thing. But, you know, I've just, well, not I say just, I've been on something called Semester at Sea uh, and traveled around the world with, what? 400, I don't know how many students. Fantastic human beings. I, I get very upset when people just point to the fact that, look at those young people. And they speak about a minute fraction who go wrong. And those who t tend to get the publicity. Now, I have been to a number of poor countries, and I have seen young people who could, who could have been enjoying life comfortably in their more affluent homes. And they are there in remote villages, building schools, clinics, teaching, teaching English and, and so forth. I, I, I take off my hat to young people and, and, and say, don't allow us oldies <laughs> to infect you with our cynicism. If you doubted that young people actually care, maybe your doubts could now be wafted away. Just look at how they have been, now I'm non-partisan, <laughs> but I mean, you, you, you see how they have been galvanized by Obama? I'm, I'm going to answer that question too by saying, do you know, when I was growing up, which is in the last century, <laughs> when I was about your age, I mean, the only drugs that were available, ah, there's only one drug, marijuana, today, you have hard drugs, and you have people who have no scruples, who are pushers and use young people. 
Look at the advertising to which our young people are exposed. Look at the things that they can access. I, I, haven't, I haven't done so, but I've been told. Um, <laughs> Don't you think actually that, I mean, our kids are really special? I mean, when, with all of those pressures that you can get young people who work in Habitat for Humanity, who say they want to see poverty made history, who, who do the kind, I mean, they are fabulous. And I just want to say to you, young people, dream. Just go on dreaming. Dream that this world can be a world without nuclear weapons. Dream. <laughs> dream that we will one day have the good sense to know that a fraction of the budgets we have for instruments of death and destruction, a minute fraction of those budgets of death would ensure that children everywhere have clean water to drink. I was going to go on, but I, I, I see the taskmaster here. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm merely a puppet in the hands of a powerful machine. In your lecture, you talked about the effectiveness of the U.S. divestment movement. And the question is, it today it often seems that very pressing human rights and social justice issues are stigmatized as being radical in American political life. And what can you recommend for us to do to bring, to allow us to bring these issues more into the mainstream of American discussion? Talk about them. I mean, talk about them and, 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 and show that they are kosher and halal. about them, I mean, and, and make those people who say you ought not to talk about them be the ones who are the left out. They, they should be the odd people out. Thank you. That was a nice, brief question. Say so. Okay. Praise me, man. <laughs> he did a great job, and it was a brilliant question. Thank you. Are you finished? <laughs> we are. We are. We're finished. Thank you. So on behalf of the Wallenberg Committee, I would like to thank <laughs> our guest, Archbishop Desmond Tutu for joining us this evening in Ann Arbor. <laughs>